Uh, we are a bit late already, so we have to, to go on. And um, while you finish here, I, I, I'm pleased to introduce you to Kati Bolli, who is um, a still in our historian. Uh, she was, as you may know, a long time uh, director of the Kapios Museum. Uh, and um, you may not know that uh, she is uh, since this week, I think, the di new director of Kumu Museum. Oh, I'm not giving a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, she's. Um, yeah. 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 Y
as well as those who supported, promoted and collected art. Thus, in the 1780s, August Wilhelm Kupel's magazine Nordisch in Selle introduced the local art lovers as a diverse group of people. For example, on the territory of today's Estonia, the Francis Kappelberg family in Vänamänor, Otto Gustav von Rosen, the owner of Kajavara Manor, Friedrich Wilhelm von Sievers, the owner of the Oisu Manor, and Otto Friedrich von Christophers, the Rüdiger Manor Lord, who tried his hand at drawing, photography, and architecture. Based on other contemporary sources, several other manor owners, known as vocational drawers, can be added to the list. Karl Magnus von Lilienfeld, the owner of Uus Goitsama Manor, Peter Reinhold von Sievers, the owner of Heintal Manor, and of course Ludwig August von Meli, who compiled an atlas of the Estonian and Livonian provinces. Serious of occasional artists could also be found among the young noble women. It is known that the high quality art teacher was specially hired by Wilhelm Johann Söge von Manteuffel, the owner of the Oyazo Manor teach his older daughters Helena Maria, later from Kügelgen, and Anna Sophia, later from Stockelberg. When examining the local press, it becomes clear that in the late 18th century, only nobles were described as art lovers. Therefore, this can be associated with aristocratic art philatelism, and indirectly also with the example of the English society of philatelism. The concept of art lover used in this presentation perhaps coincides best with an early concept expressed by Johann Wolfgang Goethe, who saw the art lover as a practitioner who die Künste nicht allein betrachten und genießen, sondern auch an ihrer Ausübung teilnehmen will, including with himself. For the same reason, and sometimes even based directly on Goethe's example, Drawing was a practical and important allocation for several German and Baltic intellectuals with bourgeois backgrounds, who became leading figures in the Baltic Enlightenment. The culture of the word, as well as the culture of the picture, was often promoted by the same people. This included the compilers of the Baltic pictorial topo topographies, above all, of course, Johann Christoph Brotze. These included Johann Wilhelm Krause, the Baltic home tutor uh, from Silesia, who later became the architect of and professor at the University of Tartu, and Gary Gotthard a local pastor's son, art and poetry lover. An interest in local history and the vocation of boy also united many Baptist pastors in the Baltic provinces such as Johann Ludwig Berger, Johann Daniel Horeb, and the most renowned Estonian, Eduard Philipp Gerber. Thus, art lovers were not a homogeneous group, but rather included different social strata, as well as different reasons for being interested in art drawing. Certain social political traits become evident when investigating the literati that drew and especially the young intellectuals, among them that migrated from Germany, we find striking similarities in the educational background of Johann Christoph Rotz and Johann Wilhelm Krause, two of the most important vocational drawers of the Baltic Enlightenment. Both come from the families of minor officials with small incomes in Silesia, and saw drawing as a skill that was worth developing to help them advance. They clearly belong to that first generation of German intellectuals whose self-taught education and self-realization was made possible by the Victorian Revolution of the 18th century. This included an explosive growth of printed graphic art, which brought illustrated calendars, title pictures and vignettes, travel books, scientific publications and much more pictorial material to the reading tables of the bourgeois. The sample pictures that they copied lived on in their drawings, drawing exercises, thereby directly influencing that what was considered worth depicting in their new homeland, as well as the way in which it was depicted. 
The second common denominator that characterizes the Baltic art lovers is the type of drawing they practice. Namely, many of them had experience with cartography. Johann Christoph Rhodes had taken private lessons in geometry, in geometry and geography in Görlitz, while Johann Wilhelm Krause practiced drafting and cartography, and later also was an army. Several noblemen, such as Otto Friedrich von Pistorgers and Ludwig August von Melli, had been military cartographers. Typically, the only training of the early, early art lovers in the Baltics was technical drafting and military cartography which is clearly discernible from the appearance and typology of the pictorial legacy of the Baltic Enlightenment. In the Baltic provinces, both noble art dilettants as well as avocational drawers among the literati were definitely more important in the promotion of local pictorial awareness as, and of the idea of art and art education than the professional community of masters. Also, Gerkart and Pari Hügelgen, the most outstanding international artists in Estonia and Livonia at the turn of the 19th century, found a common language with the local educated art lovers. Hügelgen did not seek common denominators with the local guilds or painting masters, but presented themselves primarily as intellectuals and literati thereby establishing the occupation of artists as a spiritual vocation. Along with the, uh, with the vocation of creating enlightenment and applied drawings, the late 18th century Baltic Victorian legacy also provides examples of sentimental approaches re related to Sturm und Drang, which opened the way for new type of artistic identity. Thus, at the turn of the century, we can already see points of contact between the local literati and the criticism related to dilettantish art practices, which appeared in the German cultural space. In contrast to the approving attitude of the Enlightenment towards an artistic vocation, a differentiation had slowly started to, to, to develop between the art lovers' dilettants and true artistry, Vara Künstlertum. This introduced the cult of genius and the romantic vision of the artist as a creator with divine talent, in whose regard their natural talent, the constant development of their artistic skill, the deep emotional values of creation and acceptance in the art world was a primary importance. Amateurs, the one who, uh, who corresponds uh, of the Baltic amateurs, the one who corresponds best with this model of the romantic creative type is Karl Gottschalk Krass, who abandoned his theological studies and career as a pastor in the late 1790s. This was motivated by an unhappy love affair, but also a consistent a conscious wish to tie his future life permanently and exclusively to art, as befitted a romantic creative type with a God-given artistic talent. So we find very many sentences and uh, a lot of uh, uh, nice talk about it in Karl Kraus' letter, letters. Uh, and he, this is there are many examples, but I'm just reading one that I hope to come to come and that I can myself überzeugen kann, the Kunstanlage sei eine meiner Verstimmten. Damit sage ich nicht, dass ich jemals Künstler sein werde, genug, wenn ich für mich selbst gerechtfertigt bin. Und so weiter. The Frass sudden departure from Livonia and his life as an artist abroad caused strong reactions at home. The honest criticism regarding the cross life choices by Karl Merkel, a prominent figure of Baltic Enlightenment, 
can be considered a good mirror of the attitude at the time, which developed into a broader introspection of the insufficient nature of art and the calling and uh, the calling of the artist as an identity or life purpose of a man. And that's one very, I think, very interesting uh, sentence that Karlik Merkel has written over after vast enthusiasm, Dr. Damas. But so macht er den Künstler. Es war mir unbegreiflich, wie ein Mann es zu seinem höchsten Lebenszweck wählen könne, aus einer durchlöcherten Röhre oder einem Kohle mit seitenbezogenen Kästchen wohlklingende Töne hervorzulocken oder gefallene Bilder mit Farben oder aus Stein zu machen oder seinen Körper graziös zu bewegen. Mir schien, das Talent zu solchen Leistungen sei eine herrliche Zugabe, zu dem Vermögen und Bestreben Höheres zu leisten. Aber allein schienen solche Leistungen nicht fähig und nicht würdig genug, die ganze Bestimmung eines Mannes zu sein. Oder sein Geistesbedürfnis zu befriedigen, sein Leben zu füllen. Was sich von dem staatsbürgerlichen Verhältnisse, dem gesellschaftlichen Charakter, und der Lebensweise vieler Künstler hörte und selbst sah, bestärkte mich in meiner Ansicht von dem Unge Ungenügenden der Ausübung schöner Künstler als einzigem Lebenszweck. Merkels Position gives us a good idea of the approach of the Baltic Enlightenment, but also the mentality of the nobility, which appreciated social activities sociability and considerate deeds for the public good to be more important than individual creative self-realization. However, in any case, the self-realization, whether through social activity or the arts, is seen as something reserved exclusively for men, the Stimmung eines Mannes. The current literary research has described the corresponding mentality based on the conflict between acts and texts, which assign artistic texts as a sub subordinate role, since they were seen as having a secondary imprint. This hierarchical rela relationship between a real act and its artistic record is characteristic not only of Baltic written culture, but also applies to the local art field and functions not only as a conflict between acts and texts, text, but also between acts and image. Noting this, it is possible to generally acknowledge that the limited aesthetic quality of, and low creative aspirations of early Baltic literature and art were caused not only by inability, but logically accompanied the social and class-related limits set on the creative freedom. In addition to the social traits, the spatial categories that have dominated local thinking are also conspicuous in the stone and territorial history of culture. This included focusing on the center and the periphery, the internal and the external, one's own and the foreign, and paying increased attention the environment and landscape. The early self-analysis of Estonian and Livonian art emphasizes the different characteristics of the North and the South, which were based on antiquity. Since the early 18th century, a special place was assigned to the Italians in European artistic thought. Starting with the earliest self-descriptions of Baltic culture, be it in the articles about luxury and good taste in the Nordic Missellen, or in the biographies of the art lovers, time and again the local climatic, natural and cultural inevitabilities are associated with Northernland or Northern. 
as Carl Krass letters demonstrate so well, the cradle of art could only be found in the south, in Greece or Italy. On the contrary, Nordic countries were not suitable for the higher art at all. Von Kunst als Kunst kann für den Norden wohl kaum ja die Rede sein, The thin forests of the Baltic could provide shelter for poetry and music, but it was not suitable for finer cultural and artistic living that would give birth to Raphael, Michelangelo's or Canova's. And if we add the self-determination that is also typical of the Baltic cultural space, namely the vision of Riga and Tallinn as, a, as Hanseatic towns, it means primarily commercial and not cultural environments. The geographic climatic self-definition of the Baltic provinces provides an additional explanation for why the local cultural creation, especially the fine arts, would not aspire to the highest goals, but were already pre-consigned to a narrow and low bay, the practical deed rather than creative self-expression. Against the background of this territorial way of thinking, it is apparent that the long-held belief about Baltic German literature also applied to the Baltic fine arts. Namely, the Baltic Germans with greater aesthetic ambitions, those who truly wanted to become writers or artists, found their creative freedom abroad. On the other hand, those who remained in the Baltic provinces for a longer time tended to quickly lose their higher creative ideas. The few early romantic type arti artist portraits recognized in the local history of art, were all born when the artist was living or studying abroad. Be it the pastel of Karlgotar Krass that has survived the excellent self-portrait of an unknown Riga-born artist, Johann Ben Kraub, who died in Paris, or the portrait drawings and paintings from a slightly later period by Otto Friedrich Ignatius, August Georg Wilhelm Petzold, and Gustav Adolf Hippius. Examining the enlightenment status related, related and spatial frames of thinking of Baltic society, it is clear that it was difficult for the concept of a creative artist, especially as a profession, to gain ground in the Baltic province. Karl Grass, the earliest example of a romantic artist type, owns his stylization to later biographers, biographers, who in retrospect have recognized his dedication and creative ambitions, but emphasized his singularity in the local cultural space. It is obvious that the local self-descriptions of art do not even try to fit creative impulsiveness with a stable lifestyle of Baltic provinces. But the image of the artist remains linked to foreignness and southern contrast. And there is a Julius Eckhart's very colorful description of the same painting what you see here, which creates really myth of romantic artists with every epithet. Ungeordnet herabhängendes schwarzes Haar fällt über einer hohe, gedankenreiche Stirn, unter welcher ein paar ernste blaue Augen hervorgezogen, die durch die kühlen, scharf geschnitzten Züge, welche sie einschließen, noch an Interesse gewinnen. Der Mann, dem diese Züge angehört haben, sieht weder nach einem gestrengen Ratsherren, noch nach einem würdigen Pfarrherrn aus. Er blickt so dünster und gespenstlich rein, dass man kaum glauben kann, er sei überhaupt unserem behaglich gemütlichen Norden entstand und habe sich daran genügen lassen, nach der Väter, Sitte, Schlecht und Recht in eng begrenztem Kreis zu leben. The Baltic Provinces of the late 18th century did not produce any great artists that 20th century art history had, has traditionally sought to appreciate. 
as demonstrated in this presentation, not only were the institutional conditions for the maturing of such great individuals lacking, but more importantly, the necessary assumption, assumptions and ways of thinking were missing from the social attitudes. Similarly to Baltic written culture, the local art life was shaped primarily by enlightened pragmatism and social interest, by acts rather than artistic description. Thus, when speaking about the art of the turn of the 19th century, one must examine the pictorial culture of the Enlightenment more broadly, taking into account the various applied functions of drawing and the wide circle of art lovers. Thank you.